just to let everyone know, we're going to wait like a minute more to allow people to log on, and then we will be uh, starting momentarily. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Joshua Tucker. I'm the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU. And on behalf of my colleague Alex Cooley from the Harriman Institute at Columbia, we'd like to welcome all of you to the latest installment of our New York City uh, Russia Public Policy uh, Seminar Series, which has now been running jointly between NYU, between the Jordan Center and the Harriman Institute for five years at this point. We were originally in person pre pandemic and we've been online uh, ever since then. Uh, the New York City Russia Public Policy Series aims to bring together uh, distinguished panels of both practitioners and scholars to talk about pressing issues uh, related to uh, Russia and the general that uh, general area of the world. Um, and as I, we've been, you know, extremely active over the last uh, ten months, in particular, uh, on all of this, uh, we will have uh, sessions throughout the spring. We we tend to meet once a month during the academic year, so you can keep abreast of of what we're going to be doing and what our next events will be through the uh, through newsletters from both the Harriman Institute and the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU. Today we're going. We're joined by a, an incredible panel, and we're going to be talking about an incredibly pressing topic, which is taking stock of sanctions on Russia, looking at what the effect of the sanctions will be on the Russian economy uh, going forward from here. We have a great set of panelists set up. I just want to call your attention to, although we've all been doing this for a long time now, to the fact that this is a, a Zoom webinar session, which means if you are on Zoom, you can ask questions for the panelists using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. The nice thing about this is you can put in questions when any of the panelists are speaking. The way the seminar is going to proceed is that each of the panelists will speak for about 10 minutes, giving some introductory remarks, and then we'll turn to asking questions. So Alex and I will be drawing from the Q&A. So you can put your question in there at any time when someone's speaking, you won't interrupt anybody, and we'll go to the questions after all the panelists have spoken. The same thing if you're on YouTube, watching us on YouTube live, you can use the comment section on YouTube to leave questions as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to introduce our panelists in turn to my colleague at Harriman, Alex Cooley. Alex? Gosh, thanks so much. And it's wonderful to be co-chairing uh, this session with you again. So um, unprecedented Western sanctions and the Russian economy has taken a serious hit so far, but according to many, it has fared better than we thought. And we've seen many uh, types of adjustments and innovation. So here to discuss these issues, we have uh, five leading experts. I'm going to introduce them uh, as I ask them to speak uh, in that order, and then we will post more complete bios in the chat um, that includes more detailed information uh, of our speakers. So first up, I'll invite uh, Oleg Itzkoki, who is the venue and Anna uh, Kodamuraju, Endowed Chair in Economics at the University of California, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Oleg, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. So um, my specialty is uh, exchange rates. Uh, and um, I got into the topic of thinking about sanctions uh, and their impact on the Russian economy from, you know, first of all, what happened with the ruble exchange rate as the war started and then sanctions were imposed. And uh, it kind of posed a number of challenges of trying to understand what, what's going on, right? Are sanctions working? You know, why ruble at first depreciated, uh, but then somehow stabilized, started appreciating. Does it mean that sanction didn't have the impact on the Russian economy or maybe, you know, the exchange rate is no longer a relevant variable because it's not a market-based exchange rate because there are all sorts of, you know, financial repressions and capital controls in place that capital cannot flow freely anymore between Russia and the rest of the world. And so we kind of got into this topic and obviously in parallel, I've been um, watching closely what, you know, what obviously, first of all, you know, what happens with the war, but also what happens with the Russian economy. Uh, right. Um, so I think it's very important to state clearly that it's a cataclysmic event for Russian economy. Right. We'll be focusing on the economy as, as, as disastrous as the war is. Uh, we're going to talk about a lesser thing, the economy, but it is a cataclysmic event 
uh, for Russian economy, it should not be underemphasized, right? It's a massive recession. Uh, economic statistic is very limited from Russia. A lot of the things were made secret. You know, in fact, such basic things as trade flows, as international trade flows, were made, you know, secret, right? You cannot just get direct access at it, at it let alone more sensitive data on government finances, for example, and so on. But we know it's a, uh, it's a sizable recession, at least in magnitude of 4 or 5% decline in GDP, um, in a year where everybody expected a 4% growth. Right, so it's a minus nine percent, roughly speaking. Right, uh, things are not looking good for the economy in the sense that the recession will probably deepen in quarter four and continue into twenty twenty three without any signs of, you know, stabilization at this point. And obviously, there are no reasons to expect any kind of economic growth in any foreseeable future. So we're not talking about a mild, you know, a mild economic consequence. Right, it's a, it's a major uh, cataclysm in the economy. At the same time, um, you know, the way the sanctions were designed back in uh, late February, early March, right, the hope was that it would be a full scale financial crisis, uh, which will make financing the war very difficult going forward, right? So, like, the expectation was that Europe and the US have enough economic uh, weapons to kind of trigger a full scale you know, immediate crisis. And indeed, uh, for the very first time in history, I believe, or at least uh, at this at this scale, uh, the West decided to use sanctions against um, uh, assets, against uh, essentially reserves of the Russian central bank. So the Russian central bank was put on the sanctions list. It couldn't do transactions, but half of its assets that were denominated in, you know, dollars and euros, the stuff that was held in Western currencies, essentially, uh, Western assets, they were frozen. And the uh, central bank lost access to something like 300 uh, billion worth of Western assets. And so this, this were the sanctions at this magnitude used for the first time. And the expectation was that they will trigger a massive financial crisis. This didn't happen, right? At first, there was a panic. There was a bank run. Uh, there was a currency devaluation. So the ruble lost you know, half of its value very fast. But somehow the central bank managed to fend it off, right? And so the question is, uh, how exactly did that happen, right? And so, you know, what comes out of our research is it turns out that, you know, financial sanctions were highly unexpected. They caused a panic in the market. But then um, Russia enjoyed a very large trade surplus in the coming next couple of months in, you know, March, February, sorry, March, April, and May. This were... Uh, months of record high export revenues, right? And so what happened was that financial sanctions were combined with import sanctions, right? And so import sanctions largely make it difficult uh, to buy foreign goods. Um, there were direct sanctions on um, a lot of specific good categories, but also more generally, uh, uh, companies started withdrawing from uh, trade with Russia. And so what we saw in the data that Russian imports collapsed by about 50%, right? So, so, so Russia started, stopped buying half of what it used to buy in the first months. What we see now in the data is that import recovered to a large extent. So they're probably somewhere between 80 and 90% of what they used to be before the war. But there was half, six months, half a year of a period when imports really collapsed. That was a massive effect. Uh, it started taking a toll on uh, the Russian industry. A lot of industries actually shut down production or sh largely shut down production. It just turns out that those industries in their contribution to GDP are a smaller part of it, right? It's the you know uh, technological industries, um, complex manufacturing and so on. This is where there was a big hit. But the main driver of Russian GDP is the commodity sector, the export of uh, you know energy, in particular oil, to a lesser extent gas, other commodities like metals and diamonds and so on. And so those sectors have not really been affected. In fact, what happened was that world commodity prices skyrocketed, right? And so as a result, Russian export revenues actually increased a lot. And so what our research suggests, basically, it makes the behavior of that Russian ruble very consistent with the story, right? Indeed, uh, once the central bank managed to fend off the bank run, and it was not very difficult to do it because the country enjoyed very large trade surplus. 
and very large uh, fiscal surplus in the first month, right? So it's true that assets were frozen, but the flows kept coming in, right? And so the fact that export sanctions were effectively not put in place until December 5th, until last week, right? Uh, it meant that the first three months created this huge buffer of resources on the income side, uh, which actually allowed it, made it fairly easy to avoid a financial crisis, uh, allowed to finance the economy for the next month. So the, the, the fiscal deficits that emerged since June, uh, to a large extent, it's possible for the government to cover them from the excess revenues they received uh, in the first month. So, for example, in a typical year before the war, it was less than 40% of Russian budget that came from commodity exports. Since uh, March, it's been 60%, right, of, of, of the budget comes from exports, and these exports revenues were very, very high, right? And so um, it, it's, it's an interesting theoretical question whether it's possible at all to have a country enter a financial crisis when it enjoys both trade surplus, fiscal surplus of the government, and there are no dollarized contracts, right? So another important feature of the Russian economy was that the contracts were actually not written in dollar terms anymore. It was, uh, it was no longer a dollarized economy for many, many years. And as a result, you know, given those three circumstances, probably um, it's, it's difficult to trigger a financial crisis, right? So the financial sanctions without expert sanctions are not very capable uh, at delivering that goal, right, a short-term goal. Of course, import sanctions take its toll, but they take its toll slower, slow, and that's what we see in the economy, but there is no major, you know, event in the financial markets because of that. And so that that's kind of basically in a um, uh, nutshell uh, what has happened, right? So now it's a much more difficult question to ask whether the sanctions policy was optimal or not from the point of view of Western countries, because there was a very acute concern that oil prices that were at $120 a barrel could go to $200 a barrel back in April. And maybe that would have created uh, much more chaos in the world economy than, you know, any benefit from a fast financial crisis in the Russian economy. In fact, I would, would like to emphasize that it's much easier to impose sanctions on exports when commodities are not in big demand, right? If there is global recession, it's much easier to sanction a country that sells commodities because there is not a big demand for commodities. In an environment where there is a huge demand for commodities, right? During an expansionary phase of the business cycle after the end of the pandemic and so on, it's much harder to impose those sanctions because you can always try to go around it. And even if you have to sell your oil at a discount of 50%, if oil prices are $150 per barrel and above, from the point of view of Russian uh, budget, it's, um, it's, it's still a windfall. And so basically this is the summary of the sanctions that were imposed. They are working, but you can only expect this much uh, from sanctions. You know, sadly we have to basically, I think conclude that uh, you know, the financial and economic tools were not powerful enough to stop the war in the first months of it. Uh, military aid to Ukraine proved to be much more effective than economic sanctions on Russia in the first six months of the war. It's not to say that economic sanctions don't matter. It has to be a combination of uh, military aid and economic sanctions and sort of kind of that's what we see happening now. And we see that actually pressure is building up economically as well. One thing that is kind of not in the cards is any imminent financial crisis, right? It's a slow recession, slow decline, but it's not uh, not a sharp crisis in any way. With the with the introduction of the expert sanctions, we do in, expect more economic pressure on both Russian budget, uh, you know, some forthcoming depreciation of the ruble as the export revenues will come down. But again, it's not going to be a very abrupt effect given the this cushion that was accumulated in the first three months of high oil prices after the beginning of the war. Great, Oleg. Thanks so much for that overview, um, and especially answering the question as to you know why no sudden financial crisis when it seemed as if um, we, we uh, the West had launched these coordinated, unprecedented uh, financial uh, sanctions against the Russian Federation. Uh, next, let's move to Maria Shagino, who is the Diamond Brown Research Fellow for Economic Sanctions Standards and Strategy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, a frequent um, advisor and commentator on 
uh, sanctions and also export controls, um, giving uh, much needed and appreciated uh, detail on these matters. Uh, Maria, uh, welcome back. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. I'm happy to be back um, in the series of yours. Uh, I'd like to bring us one step back, actually, as I was asked to talk about Western strategy um, on sanctions. And I think as in any sanctions regime, it's important to understand the rationale and the design of sanctions before venturing into their assessment, although Alex's uh, points were uh, already well made here. So if we compare the sanctions regime, this sanctions regime um, with 2014, the objective was rather more modest. It's not about behavioral change per se, but about this financial and technological attrition to erode Russia's ability to wage this war, basically indirectly compelling the Kremlin to give up the war it's waging in Ukraine. In 2014, the, the objective was rather more ambitious, was to compel Russia to withdraw from Eastern Ukraine without seriously harming the rest of the global um, economy. So with this uh, rationale um, since February, it was to find these asymmetries where Western strength intersected with Russian vulnerabilities, in particularly Russia's dependence uh, on high tech, um, and high-end tech, also foreign capital and currency trade, um, as Oleg pointed out, to unleash this um, sudden uh, financial crisis, which didn't happen. And again, we need to look at the design of sanctions. So the slogan was to start high and to stay high. And I think we did start high, whether we stayed high is a big question mark. So by starting high, uh, the measures that were imposed were quite hard hitting. Again, was rarely imposed against the G20 economy, hence very complex effects, some of which unintended positive and negative unintended consequences. So we talked about freezing central banks reserves. Again, issue, uh, the measure was on, only imposed against rock states as Cuba, Iran, Syria the SWIFT in major banks, but only seven on the other hand, um, sanctioning systemic financial institutions uh, such as Verbank, uh, VTB and so on, and imposing these novel expert controls um, through the novel instrument, which is called foreign direct product rule, which was only imposed in the past against one company, Huawei now is imposed on the whole country. So that was unprecedented in scope, severity and swiftness, and all of that was coordinated because there was ample time also to gather support to, to force this diplomatic backing. The Biden administration conducted more than 180 consultations by that point. And we see the, the emergence of these key nodes across the Atlantic, but also internationally. So on the central bank, we see this tandem between Janet Yellen and Mario Draghi to, um, to seize Russian central bank's asset. Sort of unsung hero is Mario Draghi, the Italy that is not very well known for being harsh on Russia, but that came, came out rather unexpectedly. On expert controls, we have the US and 37 countries. Again, some of them like Taiwan, South Korea, rarely join any non-UN sanctions, uh, also unprecedented. So again, it was the first global use of such massive economic uh, power against a single country of such size. And that was also compounded by the, the self-sanctioning impact, which wasn't factored in by the Kremlin. By now we have more than 1,300 companies that either curtail or entirely withdrew from Russia, and that has amplified the impact. So in words of uh, Wally Adeyemo, the Deputy Secretary of the US Treasury, the idea was to, to make Russia to do two choices, either to waste that fortress Russia, that foreign currencies reserves that they have built up uh, by February to stock up the market or to prop up the currency or to spend it on the war effort. And that's basically juggling these two things. And in the long hand, we'll see um, that it will be much more difficult to, to balance this um, also in, in combination with uh, declining uh, social spending. 
Unlike the 2014, we also see the emergence of sanctions as part of a broader strategy. We see that the US is still in the driving seat, but the EU also has learned more how to, to wage sanctions. Um, so as, as Alec pointed out, uh, sanctions came in combination with military support, economic assistance to Ukraine, which has proved to be uh, perhaps in the short term more important. We also see that G7 has emerged as this coordinating body. Um, for example, the key decision again on the central bank's assets on SWIFT, gold imports, also the price cap were mainly negotiated and tested as a, as a potential measure there, which is very um, uh, contrasting with 2014. We see the transatlantic burden sharing, uh, which comes with the, for example, US releasing more uh, strategic oil reserves or Japan sending more LNG to Europe. So we see more of that trying to, to build that uh, resilience uh, cross atlantically. And we see more efforts on Europe's side to build that resilience at home. Ultimately, any statecraft starts at home, so your options to wage sanctions starts from the fact how resilient your economy is. And we see some of the things that Europe, and particularly Germany, where I'm based now, uh, are quite inconceivable um, that we didn't expect uh, Germany to phase out, for example, the Russian gas in the short term. But at the same time, we see the limitations of sanctions. Even these unprecedented sanctions have failed to deter a nuclear power uh, to wage this war. So we need to basically go a drawing board and to understand why we failed with these unprecedented sanctions. Was it because they, the costs were low or was it lack of unity that the Russian regime thought that um, Europeans, Japanese would not join it, and how to actually measure this threshold that would be right to deter any other power, looking at China in particular. We also see the limitations of sanctions in the short term, right? What they can do um, in the short term because they need time to unfold, and we're seeing it both with sanctions and with expert controls now. Uh, sanctions have also limitations against the military aggression. Ultimately, missiles fly faster than, than any sanctions, so we need to have paced expectations, right expectations with what they can do. The timing is, is also important, as Alec pointed out. Um, while the freezing central bank asset was one of the most powerful tools, by now, Russia is basically recouping what it has lost through, through this freeze. So again, sometimes it's not the sanctions, uh, the type of sanctions that is imposed, but also the timing, if the timing of the sanctions is right. And it is also underlined to, to us uh, in the West that this interdependence and lack of resilience also shapes the design of sanctions. We are in the tenth month of sanctions, and we still haven't really target Russia where it hurts is the energy sector. So December 5th is this red mark in our calendar with EU um, oil embargo and also the price cap, but that's the beginning of where it could potentially hurt Russia. Um, also, so I spoke about the, the objective of sanctions, but looking at the, the other side of the sanctions mechanism, so to say, we have the common objective, but we don't have a common end game. And that's a big problem. Going back to November, already we see that this disagreements on how to view Russia's place in Europe and Europe's security architecture has already shaped uh, the type of sanctions that were uh, supposed to be uh, imposed if Russia invades Ukraine. For example, no contingency planning was um, was discussed in Europe around energy sanctions, right? So that's also quite um, uh, quite indicative here. The, the disagreements around what constitutes an escalation or a deterrence, and here is the Nord Stream 2 case is a big one, has also been problematic. Unlike 2014, now the, the sanctions mechanism that we have doesn't have conditionality. And that is problematic from the point of view that we don't have that linkage mechanism, how to link sanctions and when to lift them. 
also because, as I said, there is no agreement on the end game, but also there is no genuine um, belief that Russia is, is actually willing to, to change its political objectives in Ukraine. So we're it is in, again, perpetual mode of imposing incremental sanctions as it was in 2014, and that makes the, 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 the war even more protracted, probably, as it is already right now. So the end game that we see uh, now, which is amb ambiguously, ambiguously defined as probably uh, purposefully so, is strategic failure of Russia. But what does it mean is viewed differently in Washington, in Berlin, and in London. Uh, so we're not talking about any military defeat uh, from Russia's side. So something in between that Russia doesn't acquire new territories in Ukraine and with Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive, the issue of Donbass in Crimea is also being more fluid and is discussed whether it's a red line or not. So looking what's next, there are still sanctions um, options are in place. We're not at the end of this escalation ladder, so to say. We don't have fatigue yet, so the current sanctions will remain for a foreseeable future. But whether we can uh, qualitatively ramp them up, that's uh, a big question mark. So again, we're in that mode of 2014 sanctions where we react to, to Russia's actions, external events such as attacks on the infrastructure or Iranian drones. And with secondary sanctions, they're still not on the table so far. The, the, the US is using the, the effects of primary sanctions. Um, and I'll stop here. Okay. Great, Maria. Thanks so much for flushing all that out, especially the points about the end game and the lack of conditionality. Uh, next, we'll move to uh, Emily Holland, who is an assistant professor in the Russia Maritime Studies Institute at the United States Naval War College, actually with links to both Columbia and NYU, having received her PhD in political science from Columbia and also holding a research appointment at the Jordan Center um, and working on a book project, Poisoned by Gas, um, looking at the intersection of energy security policy and energy dependence. Uh, Emily, uh, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Um, am I off mute? Yes, okay. So, um, so I was asked to speak a little bit about the effect of sanctions on Russia's energy sector. And I think that my comments are going to fit in very well with our last two speakers um, because uh, when I often talk about the energy sector, people are surprised, perhaps, um, by the resilience of, of Russia's energy sector. And I say, well, yes, there have been some factors which have made Russia's energy sector um, extremely profitable over the last few months. But the type of sanctions, as Maria said, the sort of no end game, no going back sanctions spell a very, very gloomy picture overall for the long term trajectory of Russia's energy sector and as a result for, for Russia's economy. So I think it's important to, to sort of get some concepts at the beginning of the discussion, because uh, most discussions of energy security um, in the West are all about security of supply, right? So the security of countries seeking to diversify their supply for their security. But of course, the opposite side of the coin also holds true. Commodity exporters become very dependent, in Russia's case, extremely reliant on the revenues of the export of their commodities for their budgets. And so having um, secure and stable buyers of that supply is a crucial aspect of security. And so one of the reasons why many people, I think probably myself included, did not expect the sort of um, very swift and clean, well, not clean, very swift divorce of European and Russian energy interdependence was because both Russia and Europe were highly dependent on that energy relationship and that both would be hurt from, uh, from a swift and sort of unprepared for divorce. So we'll talk a little bit about sort of what is what is happening to sort of Russia's energy economy now. So uh, as, as people have mentioned before, in November, Russia's rev revenue actually rose, mainly thanks to its energy industry, particularly Gazprom. Gazprom is Russia's state-owned conglomerate gas company, which exports natural gas um, to, to many suppliers, but mainly to, to Europe. 
And um, uh, in November, Gazprom actually contributed a 1 trillion ruble dividend and sort of a one-time excess tax payment towards the budget. And that actually led to a budget surplus in Russia. But that's that's sort of artificial because it was a one-time um, uh, payment from Gazprom. And Gazprom earned this windfall revenue basically because of extremely high gas prices in Europe, extremely high global gas prices, thanks to the global energy crisis, which preceded Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I think it's very important to know that the world was already heading towards an energy crisis prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so all of the forces that Russia's war unleashed, the uncertainty in the markets, basically contributed to a problem that was already there to begin with, which is that there was a, a supply shortfall of basically all major energy producing commodities, oil, natural gas, and, and hard coal, on hard uh, fuels as well, it's coal. So, so it's not just a sort of one, um, one tranche energy security problem, it's a major global, global energy crisis. So Gazprom earned this windfall revenue because of high prices. And without that, there probably would have been a negative budget trend, actually, in, in Europe um, since September. Uh, the Russian Ministry of Finance doesn't usually count oil and gas dividends as oil and gas revenue, as far as I'm aware. Um, and so that's why the reliance on the budget of oil and gas is always sort of larger than official numbers from the Ministry of Finance. So that just shows you what a problem it is uh, that, that the West had decided to sanction Russian commodities over the long term. Um, there were sort of major changes to the Russian economy over the past few months. There are changes in industrial output between February and October. Um, the energy sector is becoming a little bit of a liability, even though prices are really high. And so the most growing sectors in the Russian economy are, are related to the war effort in some way, metal goods, textiles, and clothing. And because of this, there'll be sort of a larger budget deficit as related to, to Russian energy. So what's happening in terms of the natural gas industry in, 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 in Russia? Well, uh, as many of you know, the EU has decided to wind down its relationship in terms of buying uh, Russian natural gas. The Probably, as Maria said, the most surprising aspect of this was Germany swiftly deciding to end its purchases of Russian natural gas, reversing a trend of the past 30 years where it had been trying to increase the amount of Russian gas it had been purchasing. Um, this was most exemplified in the uh, the uh, Nord Stream 2 saga and its uh, demise a few months ago. So that was very surprising. Um, so as a result, you know, over the past decade, Russia had been looking towards other markets because it knew that eventually Europe was going to decarbonize and eventually, you know, perhaps past 2050, that relationship would wind down. Russia had been looking towards China as an alternative market. So uh, this has accelerated in the past few years, and, and Russia is increasing its gas supplies to China via the Power of Siberia pipeline, which links Russia to China, well above already contractual obligations. So last week, Gazprom announced a daily supply record um, about 17% higher than contracted volumes to comply with the Chinese request to increase daily gas supplies in December. Uh, now, the expected capacity of Power Siberia um, is 22 BCM by 2023, and by 2027, this pipeline will reach its maximum design capacity at 38 BCM per year, um, and it's connected a whole variety of different areas. One of the most important things is uh, that China recently activated a section of that pipeline that would link it to uh, eastern provinces, which are basically link Shanghai to Russia. So that's pretty good, but even after Russia only fulfills its uh, power of Siberia fulfills its its maximum design capacity of 38 BCM per year, that's only 25 percent of Russian gas exports to EU in 2021. So that Chinese gas cannot take the place of all of the sales to Europe that Russia was happening. It's only a quarter of it. So Russia would have to really dramatically ramp up its sales to East Asia to recover those lost volumes from gas. And there are many technical reasons why it's very difficult to do so, right? Uh, there are different gas fields that supply Europe than they do China. So you'd have to rebuild completely new infrastructure to link that. And that's expensive and takes a long time and requires a lot of the capital investments. So pivoting in gas is not very easy. However, of course, as, as was mentioned here before, the main uh, you know, sort of moneymaker for the Russian state is, of course, oil. 
So let's talk a little bit about oil and, and the price cap, which is the, the newest thing in the news. So before the price cap, um, Russian oil production was actually fairly, fairly resilient since February. So in April 2022, right after um, the beginning of the um, of the energy sanctions were, were announced, Russian oil output dropped by 12%. But in May, um, by just the next month, Russian oil companies had reorganized logistics and had adapted and production recovered. And so in August, oil production was higher than in even August 2021. the IEA just released a report saying that Russian exports were actually at their highest since April in November, um, but revenues dropped by about 0.7 billion to 15.8 billion barrels a day because of the lower prices and a wider discount in what Russia was having to offer on its oil to to keep to keep that oil flowing. So the G7 oil price cap, which uh, just came into effect, sort of announces that it's going to apply to any purchase of crude exported by sea from Russia as of 5th December, um, provided the purchase involves either the maritime, financial, or any other service of any other entity based in a coalition member in the G7. And so there are two goals of this. The first is sort of just a broader sanctions package, of course, aimed at reducing revenue from oil that may be used to wage war in Ukraine. And the second, of course, is to keep Russian oil on the market, even in the face of the EU oil embargo, which came into effect on December 5th, so potentially sort of increasing oil prices and and adding to global inflationary pressures if they were to come off the market. So there, basically, Russia has a few options of what it's going to do. And it's a little bit too early right now to see the effects of this. We haven't really seen the effects of, of the, um, the oil sanctions uh, and the oil embargo come into place. So one thing that Russia can do is uh, evade sanctions. All right? And we're seeing this already happen over the past few months. We're seeing Russia learn how to evade those sanctions. There's many sort of tricks they can do in terms of re-registering ships or spoofing AI or doing all of these different things. But, you know, that's difficult. Um, another thing that they can do is that other entities can step up to replace those Western services. So, for example, Russian or Chinese insurers could step up and say, we're going to insure these ships and keep them on the market and and, and so they won't be subject to these sanctions. Um, Russia can also threaten not to sell to any price cap country. And this is what they've said they're going to do. Um, It could also decrease production. So keeping oil off the market could drive up the price of oil and then increase the revenue that Russia earns on non-capped sales. This would, of course, depend on the reaction of OPEC, which is complicated. Um, So there's a variety of things could do. But even if Russia, say, does comply with the sanctions, There are some issues. So the first is it's very hard to monitor compliance. So setting up an effective international administration to ensure that no Russian, no ship carries Russian crude over $60 a barrel will be difficult. And how would you even monitor side payments? So that's sort of the difficulty with the price cap. Um, What it would require to work is a long term commitment by the West to stick to these sanctions. Right. And that's sort of the issue, I think, with a lot of the sanctions is that takes a little bit of time for sanctions to bite. And so Russia often bets that the West will balk before it does, right? That the West will will say, we can't take these sanctions anymore and sort of break up and splinter, whereas the Russians will continue to bear the cost of these. Um, uh, The Russian energy industry is adapting, but there are long-term problems with that, right? So one thing that the Russian energy industry needs is it needs capital investments. It's got a lot of aging fields, has a lot of infrastructure to build, so it needs a lot of investment in infrastructure. And it's actually been locked out of a lot of that Western capital since 2014. So now it's even further locked out. Where does it go from that? Does it turn to China? China's already investing quite a bit. How does it keep up uh, its energy exports when its markets are shrinking and it's forced to face to turn to China, which is a uh, basically less um, a less compliant uh, consumer than the European Union. So the long term picture for the Russian energy industry is pretty gloomy, uh, but the short term may not be as bad as people thought it would be initially. And I'll and I'll stop there. Great, thanks for that uh, takeaway, Emily, and also for that detailed analysis <laughs> of the new uh, Russian energy map. Um, so uh, now we will move on to um, another uh, friend of our uh, community, uh, Maximilian Hess, who is a Central Asia Fellow in the Eurasia Program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and has uh, also extensive experience in political risk analysis 
uh, also the author, as you'll see in his background, of the upcoming economic war, Ukraine, and the global conflict between Russia and the West. So happy to plug that for you. Congratulations on the book, Max, and welcome. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and so I'm going to try to add what I can about some of the geostrategic implications of what's going on and how I understand and see sanctions and what is happening with them. Um, and also the sort of Russian counter effort. And then in the end, sort of talk about uh, where I think that this is all headed. So, uh, you know, the first point that um, I want to mention really is that we have to think about sanctions in a framework that was first advocated by Jennifer Harris and Robert Blackwell, uh, two um, scholars then at the Council for Foreign Relations. Um, Jennifer Harris is now on the National Security Council in the Biden administration as well. And this is what they call geoeconomics war by other means. And they really put forward the argument, which had been made by others before, uh, that sanctions were primarily a, a form of, and other tools of economic statecraft uh, are really a form of interstate competition. And I think that this is really important to understand because especially in recent years, there's been a lot of discussion about sanctions and their efficacy and whether they're meant to change tra uh, states' uh, policies or potentially provoke regime change as well. And I actually don't think that sanctions are intended to affect either of those, um, which can be seen pretty well well in the example of Cuba or in Iran. The United States has had sanctions on Cuba for some 60 years now. Uh, Fidel Castro hasn't been in office for almost a decade. Raul Castro, his brother, is now out of office as well. Um, but Cuba continues to remain, at least nominally, a Marxist state. Um, the difference, however, now and why so many people in the United States, particularly in the Cuban community, um, still support sanctions or why so many people uh, in the U.S., particularly on the right, support sanctions against Iran, although it hasn't changed. Uh, the regime's agenda or, or the individuals in power there at any point is because the sanctions are aimed at fundamentally weakening those countries and making them lesser uh, of geoeconomic and geopolitical competitors. So in short, of course, I don't think why anybody in Washington or in Brussels would be upset if ultimately the sanctions led to a change in the Putin regime or its collapse or forced it to abandon its strategy in Ukraine. But overall, the sanctions are really intended to um, stop Russia from being as capable, having as much uh, power, and therefore being able to take actions like it's taken in Ukraine again or to do so uh, in neighboring countries. Of course, one of the tragedies of this is, is that yes, the individuals who live in Russia um, and who are directly affected by this will over the long term be made poorer. And yes, the West in the short term has faced significant costs as well from its own sanctions regimes, as well as from some of Russia's efforts, which we'll discuss. Um, but I would argue that those are far less. Now, the really sort of important date here, I think that we have to focus on is the real signal of when the various economic skirmishes, and you can use what analogy you want from when 2014, when sanctions really in earnest began to be placed against Russia, and particularly with the introduction of the sectoral sanctions, which were the first move that said, okay, we're not going to entirely black risk Russia, but we're going to go after their access to credit and the dollar system and show how dependent they are on that uh, and be able to pressure them that way. It really escalated tremendously on the 26th and 27th of February, two days after Russia's full-scale invasion. Uh, of Ukraine when they decided to cut, when Western leaders agreed the central bank sanctions and cutting off of Russia um, from essentially the global economic system. Um, now, I, I would slightly disagree with the earlier statement that this was entirely unprecedented. Japan was similarly cut off uh, by the United States from its economic system uh, in 1941 under the Trading with the Enemy Act and the lead up to um, uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, which uh, is, is another issue entirely. But the real sort of difference between then and now is that we now live in the post Bretton Woods era. So Bretton Woods was the agreement after um, World War II that essentially made the dollar the international reserve currency with then convertibility into gold, which then, pre then President Nixon got rid of the gold convertibility and left us in this sort of era where ultimately not through policy design, um, but in fact through a whole bunch of market driven factors, the world ended up really dependent on uh, the US dollar with the US dollar or 
uh, ending up and still now to this day as the main global reserve currency. There had been some uh, discussions in recent years and there has been a lot of questions about whether that's going to change. Um, of course, one of Russia's key aims in its actions on the economic war was to try to undermine that. And we can see that in statements from Putin himself in which he's criticized the dollar system both before and after. But I would argue that one of the unique features about the dollar system that has made it so resilient is that it is anti-fragile. It tends to get stronger in times of international crises. So whether that be the global financial crisis uh, after 2008 and 2009, leading to a lot of moves into U.S. Treasury reserves, or today where the U.S. dollar has been uh, in recent weeks at 30-year highs, um, despite the sort of inflationary environment uh, that Washington is experiencing, as is much of the rest of the world, um, that actually that that system in many ways has gotten stronger uh, than it is today. Um, the point that I would make is this was a very targeted move by the U.S. of so taking away Russia's reserves was, yes, a huge impact in terms of weakening Russia in the short term, but really this is about the long-term future. Russia is now cut off from the main global credit uh, and financial networks. We haven't seen even Russia's supposed you know, friend without limits, as was agreed with China just before uh, the war. China has not been willing to extend Russia credit, so they're happy to buy Russian commodities on the cheap, but they're not willing to uh, give Russia credit uh, in a way that could undermine its own position for all of China's own bluster. It also continues to operate the Hong Kong dollar uh, pegged to the U.S. dollar. So I don't think their willingness um, to affect that has really changed. We did see Russia try to put back against this. And one of the sort of the one where area where I think the West could really still strengthen sanctions is that, yes, there is still some ruble convertibility open. So we've seen the swift sanctions happen, uh, but we've seen essentially the West say, and the U.S. in particular, if this goes on, we are willing to cut off ruble convertibility entirely. So my point on the value of the ruble um, and the like would be. Of course, the exchange rate is now largely affected by Russia itself trading, um, and it is not a market rate. Um, but what really matters is that as soon as a dollar crosses into the Russian banking system or the physical border with Russia, that dollar is no longer fungible with a dollar anywhere else in the world. It is worth less. Exactly how big that discount is remains to be seen. A lot of Russia's actions have been to try to keep that discount as, as close to you know, essentially one cent as possible, whereas over the long term, part of the West strategy is to try to drive that discount down significantly. So we see Russia's use of its dollars, including the money that it has gained from those surpluses earlier this year, extremely limited and having to put them into investments, such as the largest one abroad has now been Turkish government bonds um, through the Turkish banking system uh, to try to keep some of that convertibility open and, and incentivizing Turkey to not fully comply with the system. But where the sort of discount of that dollar ends up is going to be really important. For context, a dollar that is in the Iranian financial system is broadly assumed to be somewhere worth 25 to 30 percent less than a dollar um, anywhere else. Um, Russia has tried to push back against this, and Russia is a very smart player when it comes not only to the sort of skullduggery that often gets talked about of, you know, boards on lord, uh, lords on boards and using kleptocracy to try to influence places, but Russia itself really understands this credit system and has taken actions to try to undermine it, whether that be through weaponizing Ukrainian debt in 2013 and 2014, or tweaking the, the wording of its own bonds to try to essentially be able to threaten mass haircuts onto uh, Western holders of them, a threat that ultimately didn't materialize. And so we saw that, for example, um, the sort of ingenuity of how Russia plays these systems with its ruble demand um, earlier this year when it said, okay, if you want to buy Russian gas, European partners, you have to buy it um, in rubles. And that was... Uh, really an attempt to keep open ruble convertibility by requiring European banks to still be able to exchange um, euros or, or dollars, depending on the terms of the contract, uh, for rubles and to, to keep that window open. Um, so a large part of the, the move away from Russian gas, I think, had to do with that weaponization of itself and understanding that it threatened to weaken the sanction regime. And then, of course, Russia's own politicization of it uh, with the shutdowns on the Yamal pipeline, that made it a lot easier for countries 
countries um, like Germany to uh, move, try to move away from Russian gas. But those costs are going to be hugely important. And as Emily and Maria uh, were talking about earlier, that's sort of one of the areas of weakness um, that would come forward. I would say also that it's worth considering when thinking about this war in eventually in hindsight in the long term is that Russia's invasion in February also came at a macroeconomic a point where the macroeconomic conditions were most beneficial for it to disrupt things. So inflation had already begun as a result of some of the disruption that was experienced at the end of 2021 from the end of COVID lockdowns, um, resuming demand. We hadn't seen inflation in 10 years. And the gas weapon um, that Russia used was also very much an inflation weapon um, we're hopefully seeing the impacts of that uh, start to weaken. Recent prints have uh, you know, shown things that are there. I will sort of uh, end with a few points, um, however, that Russia does still have some cards left to play. Uh, it can still take further action on oil markets. Russia has uh, the ability to I would say at this point with the oil cap only really cut off all suppliers though, the oil cap has locked in a lot of those discounts. It will be hoping to stir disruptions in Europe over the long term. There's a lot of potential areas of weakness in Austria, Hungary, Italy, um, where it will be seeking to undermine things. It could also look to um, affect uranium markets. Um, and then, of course, there's still actions that the West can take. Some of those have already been discussed, secondary sanctions, a potential gas price cap, uh, which just um, wasn't really uh, agreed today, uh, but the European Union will still discuss. And then the final point that I want to end on is the economic war will very much be important to the future of Ukraine, no matter what happens on the battlefield. If the West gives up on the economic war, and I don't think Russia can win it, I only think that the West can lose it, that will really affect Ukraine's ability, um, not only in the short term to be able to fight back against Russia, but if there is any kind of ceasefire, peace agreement, or end that isn't the Putin regime's collapse, I think it's very likely that Russia will just seek to build up a war chest again um, to attack Ukraine again in the future. So um, the economic war in some ways has to continue uh, even beyond um, necessarily what happens on the battlefield in Ukraine to ensure that its sovereignty continues and that Europe and the wider world remain at peace. Max, thank you very much. Uh, and our uh, final panelist today is uh, Laura Solanko, who's a senior advisor at the Bank of Finland Institute for Emerging Economies, responsible for Russian economic policies, banking sector developments, energy markets, and Russia's integration in the global economy. Uh, Laura, welcome um, to this panel. We're really looking forward to your uh, expert insights. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for including me. Um, so I'm, I'm going to add a macroeconomist view on how sanctions and the war will affect Russian economy, both this year and then, then going forward. So in a sense, um, the, um, we, we can think about the, the, um, there being three steps of this Russian wartime recession. One, <clears throat> which is almost over. Second, that's ongoing. And the third, that, that is, is, is still still ahead of us. So the first, first step of the crisis is something that has actually has been what, what already described by, by, by Igor on, and that was the acute crisis when the war started and the, the, the unprecedented sanctions package were imposed. And that's clearly the, the that was the re point in time when, when many people, both inside Russia and outside, sort of thought that the sanctions and the war will, will lead to a financial collapse in Russia. And as we now, now very well see, that, that did not materialize uh, exactly for the reasons already mentioned. First, uh, what is strong and what is skillful response by the Russian Central Bank? A key uh, sort of hiking the interest rates, uh, closing capital accounts, uh, using window guidance, relaxation of regulatory frameworks, and all that helped to stabilize markets and avert bank runs. And then at the same time, drop in imports and increase in export prices led to extremely large forex inflows, which then helped boosting both government revenues and overall confidence in the markets. So little by little, part of the part of the um, 
part with the um, regulatory measures could be could be withdrawn and, and the acute crisis was more or less over. Of course, the cost of these measures is that ruble no longer is a freely convertible currency. And, 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 and that's sort of a, that's probably something that's going to going to be a feature of Russian markets for, for a long time. Now then, sort of a, all of us at the same time, with both of the acute crisis, we, we started to see the second step of, of this recession, which is uh, the decoupling of Russia's economy from the international economy and the reorientation of foreign trade. Uh, we've already discussed a lot about uh, financial sector sanctions and the energy energy market sanctions, um, but I, I would like to highlight the 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 importance of those restrictive measures that hit Russia's capability to import things. So, um, in a way, the the current sanctions regime have has has clearly so, shown that even though Russian economy overall is is not particularly dependent on imported inputs, its uh, medium and high tech industries are exactly as dependent as everyone else globally on imported inputs. As an example, the share of imported input inputs in um, computer and electronic equipment industries in 2018, which is the last year we have the OECD TIVA data, was exactly the same as the share, the equivalent share in Germany. And the sanctioning countries, meaning meaning the the EU, the US, UK, and the Allies, accounted for about 60% of these imports. And now much of these imports are no longer available, either due to formal sanctions, difficulties in arranging financial logistics, or due to the Western firms voluntarily withdrawing from Western, Russian markets. And then naturally this this. Uh, Disappearance of, of many of these imported inputs forces Russian businesses to, to either rely on domestic alternatives or to find alternative supply routes for the foreign goods or to find alternative foreign suppliers. And all of these imply lower quality and higher prices for, for these components, raw materials and funding. And then consequently for imply of lower quality and high sort of a higher final prices of final products inside Russia. Uh, the often cited example is, is, is Russian automobile industry. And, and based on the at least based on the newspaper reports, it looks likely that the future new Russian cars will often lack some, for example, some security features we, we take for granted in, in Western economies. So there's, there's the, the effect of sanctions and Western firms withdrawing from the market is, is causing both decoupling from the global markets and sort of a reverse industrialization of the Russian domestic industries. Something the, the Russian in, domestic industries are becoming more primitive in, in a sense. <clears throat> And that, that is, I think, uh, one feature of the sanctions packages that's not often very well understood, but I think that's, that may, may have a dramatic Im impact on the Russian economy going forward. And then really the third step, the, the, uh, the step number three that's still ahead of us, it's the adjustment to the new normal. Uh, the Russian authorities clearly assume the sanctions will remain in place for long, and therefore a structural transformation of the of the economy is necessary. Uh, and these are uh, never clearly clearly set out, but but clearly the the new economic structure will entail a much larger role for the state. It will entail at least partial isolation from the global economy, and consequently lower standards of living. Uh, so, and that one one part of this larger state is 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 of course the fact that any war is likely to increase public spending, and Russia is no exception. The budget plans for 2020 to 24 assume actually a very very significant increase in expenses for 
defends and internal security. That's the pencil to increase by more than 60% in nominal terms. And, and then the indirect role of the state will also increase due to increased regulation, uh, both on business activities and on civic, li civic liberties. And then all, all that will, will certainly lead to state and state-owned enterprises being, being the major investors in the Russian economy going forward. Um, so, so in a way, we why sort of the isolation is is on, partly on a lack of imported inputs, but also a lack of imported ideas. And I, I think the the isolation from global exchange of ideas, of research and innovation, is something that's certainly going to drag be a drag on Russian growth going forward, and the brain drain only enforces this. So hence the new normal, the step three of the economic recession in Russia will mean adjusting to an equilibrium that is clearly worse than the previous one. So this leads leads to, 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 to my conclusion in a sense that Russian economy is in a very much self-inflected recession and the recovery is very far away, and um, and that's um, mean meaning that the growth prospects on on the macro level look extremely bleak for many years forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, um, and thanks everyone for these incredibly illuminative presentations. They did not uh, disappoint my anticipation for them. Uh, we, I want to re remind the audience, you feel free to ask questions in the Q&A if you're watching on YouTube to put it in the YouTube comments. We've got a lot of great questions there already. So I think I want to try to bundle a few of the questions that have appealed that have appeared in the Q&A, which is to ask a little bit about other countries' involvement in this. So one of the questions from Thomas Leary has to do with what is the extent of Iran's assistance in sanctions evasion and what is Iran uh, getting out of this? Another question was asking more about the de-dollarized trade in rubles, rupees, yuan, you know, the extent to which this is allowing for sanctions avoiding. Um, and then finally, there was a question about India buying Russian oil. So, and as a political scientist, I'm kind of interested in this because if part of the story here is this unprecedented Western cooperation, the flip side of the story has been these kind of fine lines that the rest of the world has been trying to walk and not getting themselves into trouble around sanctions, but on the other hand, taking advantage of discounted prices in Russian oil, or in other cases, selling drones or all sorts of different things of so continuing to sort of keep Russia afloat. We saw, I think it was about a couple of months ago, uh, maybe even less than that, what seemed to be some public displays of displeasure uh, directed directly at Putin, which had been kind of a rare thing in past events coming from the Chinese, the Indians, the Kazakh leader. So in view of this kind of public display of, of maybe, or maybe if that public display was a signal that some of these countries that have floated Russia a little bit, albeit in this careful manner, are getting a little tired of having to do so, um, what does that pretend for the future? So I guess it's a two-part question sort of, and, and to answer any of the specific questions in the Q&A about Iran, India, de-dollarized trade, those would all be extremely helpful. But then the sort of two bigger point questions is like, how important has these actions of co this collective group of countries in helping Russia to get past the sanctions been in view of everything else you told us about you know, the fact that Russia was still having access to energy money and those sorts of things. But also what does this pretend for the future? Do we think, that these the other countries in the world, not the West, not the Russia, could collectively sort uh, start to tighten the screws on Russia economically, and what kind of effects could this have? I see a lot of heads nodding, so I'll let anybody who wants to go on this. Well, I'll just go first um, to uh, Max, and then Maria and uh, Oleg all had mentioned on this, and then I've got a different Great. question for you, Emily. <laughs> Great. Uh, on uh, Iran in particular, I mean, you know, Iran and Russia can share experiences on some of their sanctions evasion techniques, the potential for more partnership and uh, some strategic oil trade. But really, you know, the, the Iranian currency is even uh, as restricted, at least, as the Russian one, if not more. They can't really offer them a lot. India and China are both, you know, increasing oil purchases from Russia. India significantly, although overall that sort of level of purchase is still 
far less than Europe would have purchased uh, last year, but they are buying it at significant um, discounts to international prices. And in some way, the oil price cap helps at least helps them lock in those discounts. You know, it's been um, quite significant on Russian blends of crude versus the uh, international Brent benchmark. The sort of, you know, real question is, is, okay, do they open, um, you know, essentially trading accounts where there's full convertibility between the ruble, um, rupee, and uh, yuan. Uh, that has not happened yet. The, 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 yuan, the rupee is more of a liberalized currency with less capital controls than the yuan, so that could potentially offer uh, Russia some routes to weaken the uh, restrictions on its own currency, but India has not agreed that even for um, oil. And, and one of the other impacts, and this gets into a little bit of the technicalities of having to move to this non- dollar basis is although interest rates are rising in the U.S. Um, and actually falling in Russia because they're still overall much higher than the um, uh, U.S. base rate, this increases the long-term financing costs of uh, any credit term agreements to um, whether that be, you know, buy or invest uh, in projects that aren't immediate commodity trade or crucially for India, also its oil, its um, weapons purchases from Russia, the cost basis of which is now uh, quite a bit higher and has additional sanctions um, risks as well. Uh, so, you know, they can help it at the margins, but they're not going to offer Russia uh, a route out unless all of a sudden China ends up in a world where it does have uh, liberalized capital markets, but that's not happening for its current liberalized currency markets, but that's not happening anytime soon. Uh, Maria? Thank you. That's a great question and great way of packaging it because the issue of third parties, third countries is key. It's uh, this third element when we analyze the effectiveness of sanctions. On the one hand, you have the design of sanctions that I spoke about. Max touched upon Russia's responses to sanctions, but this third element is the position of third countries because they can help Russia. So we mentioned quite a few countries here, and I think we need to distinguish them. So Russia is pivoting to third countries in the attempt to alleviate the, the impact of sanctions. On the one hand, is increasingly pivoting to sanctioned peers as Iran, Venezuela, North Korea, and is basically becoming the peer of these countries, right? In 10 months, we will place Russia almost on the same level, which wasn't conceivable. And on the other hand, it's pivoting to, as uh, sanctions literature refers to them, black knights, those third countries, non-aligned countries, Turkey, China, India, who have a much larger potential to help Russia. So when it comes to Iran, we heard about drones. Um, that's, I think, sort of points that the limitations of what Iran can, can supply, because as one of the research studies shows, Iran itself is 80% reliant on Western semiconductors. So it's not to say that Iran has unlimited capacity to supply Russia drones um, and uh, you know, there is this partnership forever. Um, Iran is most handy plus Venezuela as sort of teacher for Russia to circumvent sanctions. And Iran has pioneered a number of tactics with spoofing, with dark fleet, and as Emily pointed out, that's the area where Russia is, is really uh, doubling down when it comes to price cap and other ways, basically to establish this new formal or illicit supply chains and to explore this unconventional financial uh, channels for these items. But we, the, there are limitations of the sanctions club, basically because these all of those sanctions peers are internationally isolated economies. They're not technologically advanced. They are uh, disconnected from the financial system. So again, there is so much they can do. They can teach you how to do it, but basically you need to pivot to this black knights to tap into much larger economies. And here, Turkey, Iran, uh, Turkey uh, China, and India are the key countries. And we see in that all of the three uh, are capitalizing on Russia's isolation both in terms of cheap commodities or items where new actors are just profiting from, let's say, Turkey re-exporting sanctioned or non-sanctioned items to Russia. So these are the ones to watch. Uh, but as Max pointed out, that there are limitations uh, from the financial point of view because dollar is still the main currency um, 
for, for, for any trading, for any invoicing. So establishing these new routes, financial routes is, is quite tedious, is not as easy. And as, as we see, uh, Russia's alternatives, SPFS as alternative to SWIFT or MIR cards didn't take off after the US came quite strongly after this. Um, any bilateral um, bilateral deals between Russia and India again didn't take off because of the threat of secondary sanctions. So India can help uh, as it help in terms of uh, you know taking off uh, oil or other commodities that used to go to the West, but that's now been sanctioned. So we'll see how much of that will be rerouted. So that will be the, the main. Light, uh, light, uh, litmus test uh, for that. I think looking forward, those countries, particularly as we, we hear China and India are getting tired. And in the long term, any escalation, and we need to mention here, I think nuclear escalation, these countries will not be uh, on Russia's uh, side. I'll stop there. Great, thank uh, you. I will... Thanks so much, Ria. Yeah, Oleg, please. Yeah, I will just quickly uh, throw in my two cents. I agree with most what uh, Maria and Maximilian said here. Uh, if we look at the data, the two big beneficiaries of um, uh, the sanctions, you can say, were India and Turkey. So these are the two countries that need to be emphasized. Turkey became the biggest uh, exporter to Russia, right? Uh, Turkey's exports to Russia increased three to fourfold. Right, it replaced Germany as the biggest Russian trade partner. And a lot of those trade flows are likely the trade flows that used to go directly from Europe to Russia and now are going via Turkey. We're gonna get our hands on the data sooner or later, and we'll see exactly how those value chains have adjusted, you know, whether it's the same goods or these are the substitutes or something like that. Right now, we don't know it in full detail. We also don't know whether Russia has to overpay you know, 50% or 100% above the price that it used to pay. But we'll see it eventually. And in that sense, sanctions are still working. But, you know, Turkey has become the biggest Russian trade partner. On the, um, in the commodity markets, India became the biggest trade partner. Uh, it replaced essentially Europe as the biggest uh, buyer of Russian oil. Uh, surprisingly, China did not, you know, you can say benefit as much. It did not increase trade with Russia as much. Uh, trade with China collapsed at first, but then it recovered, but it did not go above the pre-war level too much. While when we look at India and Turkey, for these two countries, the pre-war levels of trade have been exceeded uh, a few fold, right? It's exactly right to think about the caps, the price caps when India is buying the soil. But again, you know, something that's important to mention, the cap is now set at $60, while the average price at which Russia sold oil before the cap was 67. So it's not at this point making a huge difference. Obviously there is potential for this cap to go down. It will be easier to push it down as you know the commodity markets cool off. Uh, if the prices in the world oil markets go down, it would be much easier to, uh, to push that price down. But you know, if we look into 2023 and oil prices will stay around that cap of 60 and the quantities that Russia sell do not drop, there is no catastrophic event uh, in terms of like revenues and budget in 2023. The revenues will be down by 20, 30 percent, perhaps, but it doesn't mean a um, you know uh, uh, that uh, a financial crisis is coming very soon. Of course, there is a possibility that oil prices will come down, or that Russia would not be able to sell uh, the same quantities as it sold uh, in 2022. So it's all possibly in the cards, and in this sense, I agree with with what Maximilian said that, you know, economic pressure is essential. The fact that it didn't stop the war in 2022, it doesn't mean that the sanctions are not working. They're really, uh, you know, making choices much more difficult, making the continuation of the war much more difficult and uh, sort of like will uh, result in some uh, peace negotiation at much better uh, terms uh, for Ukraine if this pressure continues. So I'll stop here. Oh, like, thank you so much. I know you have to leave early. So I really I just want to thank you as well for participating uh, on the panel here today. I'm going to pivot the question I would have asked Oleg as a follow up, but I'm going to give it to Emily um, instead. Although, Oleg, if you have two seconds later more, you feel free to jump into this. So the $60 cap, um, uh, do we think this is going to stay where it is? Is this an opening gambit? Is the $60 cap likely to come down 
Was the negotiations to get the $60 cap so contentious that it's unlikely to come down? Oleg, if you want to take two seconds on this, and then I'm going to pivot to Emily on this question. And I want I have a second uh, second question I want to ask you, Emily, as well. I, I actually, yes, thank you. So I actually do not have uh, a clear idea about this. This is in the cards, but I don't have a prediction. Would be very curious to hear what Emily says. But I forgot what I meant to say is that at this point, whether the trades happen in dollars or in rupees or yuan or other currencies, it's actually not as important. Most of the trades are in dollars, as Maria was saying. And in fact, the Russian financial sec uh, uh, sector has not fully been sanctioned. So Gazprom Bank, for example, is not sanctioned. It means that it's part of the uh, international financial system can clear at least international trade in uh, Western currencies. In this sense, we're not at the stage where there is an acute need to switch to alternative currencies. This will be difficult and costly if it needs to be done. It's not impossible, but we're not quite at the stage where this is uh, a looming question, right? So far, the ability to trade in dollars, which is by far the uh, cheapest way to conduct international trade, has not been cut off. And this is maybe in the cards for future rounds of sanctions, but it's too early kind of to say whether, you know, alternative currencies will be used and how easy it will be uh, to implement. It's sort of going to be a new experiment, which has not really been done. Right. And so this is something to watch for in 2023, perhaps. Thanks so much, Emily. I, I want to pivot to you. Uh, we have a couple of energy questions that have come in. So A, I'm interested in, very interested in this question of the $60 cap. Is this fixed in stone, or are we going to see a gradually ratcheting down on it? Uh, secondly, we had a question um, in the from uh, in the chat about uh, from Andrew Fink about the European holdings of Russian state companies and thinking specifically about the Serbian oil company NIS, which is majority owned by Gazprom, Neft and Gazprom. Does that have an effect on sanctions being uh, evaded here? And then we also got another question on YouTube which I'll throw to you for Russia gas, but I think we'll throw out more generally where somebody wanted to know if there was a, uh, you know, is there a killer sanction? You all have said nothing, none of these sanctions had de had instant devastating effects. Is there a killer sanction that would have instant devastating effects? And Emily, you can pick and choose from all three of those to answer with follow-up on oil and gas. Okay, so so I'll start with the with the price cap. So you know there are extreme disagreements <laughs> over what and the sort of economic community about what will happen to the price of oil. Like I think that's putting it mildly over the next few years, right? So it is likely that the price of oil could come down. Uh, we are also seeing China now relaxing its zero COVID policy, which could increase demand. But how quickly that happens and to what extent and how fast are all major unknowns. So it is likely that the price cap could decrease, right? That is sort of always built into the discussion is that you could bring the price down. And that's much easier than raising the price cap, right? So, so that could happen. Um, and, and sort of getting to this point in the price cap negotiations was so difficult because striking the balance of punishing Russia enough, but keep giving them the incentive to keep that all on the market is a very fine balance that really depends on a lot of huge macroeconomic forces, including the price of oil, including you know who's willing to buy it, where it's going, all of these sorts of things. So yes, the price cap could come down. I think what's going to happen if I if I had to if I had to guess is that the West is going to be in a wait and see for a while, because as we've discussed, it really takes a while to sort of see the effects of the price cap. What happens? How is Russia reacting? Is it going to do sort of all of these these dastardly sort of dark black market um, uh, strategies to avoid it? Will it stop selling altogether? We just don't know. So I think we have to wait and see. And I'm sorry, that's not a very satisfying answer. Um, as regards to European uh, companies or Russian holdings of, of European energy companies, this is a great question. So, so one of the things that Russia did over the past several decades was it had a strategy, it had a vertical integration strategy where it tried to buy up all of the aspects of the vertical transmission chain in Europe, right? So from distribution networks, national energy companies, pipelines, everything. In 2009, however, the EU passed a law called the Third Energy Package, which was basically an anti-monopoly package, which forced Russia to sell off a lot of its holdings um, so that to break up monopolies. So the Serbian company, NIS, Serbia is not in the EU, is still a Gazprom holding. What we've seen in Europe, however, is that Gazprom has really had to sell off most of its major assets in Europe, 
or Europe over the past year has expropriated them, nationalized them, right? So we've seen now Europe just saying, no, you can't do this. We're going to take them over and buy them out from you altogether. So NIS is still there in Serbia because Serbia is not a member of the EU. Serbia is an interesting position. Um, Alexander Vucic, who's the prime minister of Serbia, has said that he is not going to be a sanctions buster. He will not allow Serbia to act as a sanctions buster. Of course, he's trying to get into the EU. And so it really becomes a political question, right? And I think as Max you know, said earlier, it becomes for all of these sort of potential spoilers in Europe, whether it be in energy or just sort of larger ideology, in Austria or Hungary or whatever, it becomes a political calculus. So for Serbia right now, the political calculus is I'm better off going with the EU, right, than than going with the you know with Russia who maybe on Putin who maybe on his way out. Um, so that's the calculus. Now, could that change? Sure, but it would be very difficult, I think, for for NIS to ask as act to act as a, a price cap or a sanctions buster because there's so much attention on it and people are people are paying attention and really would not allow that to happen. But it's a great question, yeah. Great. And next, I'd like to go to Laura and throw a couple of the questions uh, her way. And you can take uh, both of these or either of these. One is a question about the role of Russia's famous uh, and prominent uh, central banker, head central banker, Elvira Nabulina, um, and, 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 and how you, we might perceive whether uh, her policies have made a difference um, in the kinds of outcomes that we've seen in Russia. Um, and then I think an interesting question from your perspective um, in Finland, a question from uh, Renate on the, some of the potential for sanctions to backfire on complying countries. Um, is there a chance that they might negatively affect alliances? Of course, Finland has moved uh, politically during this crisis, of course, and also applying NATO. Um, what do you see uh, from the ground there about the impact on sanctions on public opinion and policymakers? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'll start with the latter one. Um, I think it's it's uh, clear that we have within the EU there are large national differences between between how both the businesses and general public uh, sees the 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 war, and and it's it's clear that Finland, uh, most other Scandinavian countries, the Baltic states, Poland. Uh, are have been very clearly anti-war and pro-Ukraine, and that that shows up in many 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 issues. It shows up in the share of, of firms withdrawing from Russia. It shows up in in opinion polls on 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 the general public asking on what whether support to Ukraine should be increased or not. And and there's there's a bit of a divide within the in the EU on on this matter. Um. As as comes to Finland, I think there's a very wide consensus among the among the Finnish businesses that the Russia as a market future market is is lost for many years. I mean that's uh, somehow written off from the books, and Russia as as a business partner, as as a trading partner, is is seen as a as a too too much of a risk, and and clearly a potential public relations disaster, meaning meaning that sort of withdrawing from that market by almost any cost would would make sense for businesses, and and that's uh that's not not going to change at least for for the time being. Then on uh, wouldn't like to comment on on any. Particular central banker. I, I guess there so some some other panelists might might have a more more use on that. But I as I as I said in the very beginning, I think I think the Russian central bank has been very skillful in managing this crisis and has been very skillful in implementing policies that have helped averting the acute financial crisis. So in <clears throat> in that that sense, then if I if I still may may uh, add a add a note on on the role of uh, non-sanctioning countries, I think it, we should be careful not to overemphasize the role of Turkey. So even if if Turkey's exports to Russia have increased more than doubled since the break of the war, of the war, the uh, the share of Russia 
uh, sorry, share of Turkey in Russia's total imports is still about only about five percent, whereas the share of China in Russia's total imports is currently closer to forty percent, making Ru Russia uh, after North Korea <clears throat> probably the most dependent country when it comes to importing goods and services from China. And I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's a position where actually Russia would like to be at. But anyhow, anyhow, do let let us not overemphasize the role, role yeah, of Turkey thank, here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that point, Laura. And actually, it, it's iterated by also Peter Rutland on YouTube, uh, uh, quoting today's Financial Times about China selling $8 billion worth of Russia today versus Turkey's 1.2. So still China playing an outsized role as a trading partner. Um, we have... Um, Couple minutes left for some final interventions. I'm going to go uh, first to Max and then, then Maria to weigh in on some of these issues. Great. Um, I've just to um, comment on the Avara Nabiolina question, Russia's central banker. Uh, Nabiolina has been the head of the Central Bank of Russia for uh, almost 10 years. Uh, now, so including she dealt with the 2014 um, crisis and the initial sanctions that were posed there as well. Uh, Nabiulina has a reputation, particularly amongst the Western financial press, that I think is wholly undeserved and quite ridiculous. Um, she has often been seen as uh, perhaps a liberal or um, at least opposed to the war. Nabiulina has adopted a uh, tactic very much beloved by journalists that was uh, initially pioneered by Madeleine Albright of signaling, of signaling her uh, sentiments by wearing different colored brooches. Uh, and then, of course, in her first statement after the war, uh, she wore an all black dress in the Financial Times and many others who I think are genuinely excellent sources of reporting on Russia said, oh, this is her symbol that she's against the war and the like. Um, I would say that, you know, central bankers normally have one of two mandates, which is, uh, you know, a full employment and price stability. Uh, sometimes, often they have both as well. Nabulina only has one mandate, that is regime stability. Um, the uh, for One of the most impactful points in the sort of sanctions history over the last 10 years was in 2014 when Rasnef, the Russian oil company, was added to the sectoral sanctions list and it had to be bailed out because it had over $10 billion in debts uh, from its purchase of TNK BP, um, a, a joint venture between a series of Russian oligarchs who are now under sanctions and BP. Um, and in bailing this out, it caused the ruble to collapse uh, greater than any other collapse than the, except for the one initially experienced this year, while simultaneously increasing interest rates. So Russians were made poorer um, as a result of this. And you know, I would end with uh, a comment that was made by Greg Uden uh, when he was asked about his opinion about her and her role. And he said, well, Albert Speer, the famous Nazi um, architect, was a war criminal as well. And uh, uh, I think I'll leave it at that. OK, Max, thank you. So, uh, Maria, uh, the final word is yours to, uh, to take us out for today. I'll address the question that was asked in the chat about the instant devastating effect. And I think it's a, it's a good question. If this unprecedented sanctions didn't work, what would work, right? So I think it's a it's a question for any policymaker and sanctions experts to, to answer here. And it needs to be contextual, is right? It brings back to, to my point I made earlier, why we failed the deterrence. Was it the, the misunderstanding of what's the right threshold of pain for Russia? Or was it the lack of unity? These reasons really needs to be flushing out before we go forward. But basically to have a devastating effect now with the current sanctions that we have in place, we have to tighten the screws to the maximum, right? And there are at least three options that I can think of that would have the devastating impact, uh, at least what sanctions can do given their limitations. Right, there's basically a full trade embargo and here oil sector would be the key one. Uh, again, we're on track with the EU, but there are the third countries as we mentioned that would need to somehow comply, which is unfeasible. Sanctioning all banks, uh, Gazprom Bank is the key one, is still being this main channel, uh, basically works as a central bank by now. Uh, there is another measure that is being floated is designated Russia as, as a terrorist state, which would work even better as the any sanctions because any financial institution is more afraid of that labeling than any sanctions. So th there are 
options out there, but again, whether it's politically and economically feasible to employ them, that's a very different question. There is also different discussions, again, against the nuclear threat, what sanctions can be put in place if Russia uses a nuclear threat. And I would be quite pessimistic here uh, because sanctions can do only so much to deter Russia with sanctions, uh, only with sanctions against a nuclear threat. Uh, it's a very, very bleak picture here. Well, bleak picture, but uh, you have covered a tremendous uh, amount of ground. So thank you, Maria. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Oleg, before. Josh, do you want to take us out? Yeah, I just want to thank uh, our audience again for joining us. This was a fantastic panel. Uh, the questions were great. I want to let our panelists know there were a lot of comments from the audience that were just praising the panelists for breaking this down in ways that could be easily understood. So I want to thank all of you again for joining us here um, at the New York City Russia Public Policy Series. Uh, keep an eye on both the Jordan Center. You can sign up for the mailing list at the Jordan Center or at the Harriman Institute. We'll have these announcements coming out with future, and we'll be doing this again monthly after everyone takes uh, a little break over the holidays here, but we'll be get, we'll be up and going again with us in the spring. And by the way, if you're a longtime listener to these series and you think there's a topic that we haven't covered that you would like to see covered, feel free to reach out, email me or email Alex. We're, you know, we're always brainstorming about what the next one of these should be. This one was just fascinating. So thanks once again to all of our panelists and thanks to all of you who joined us. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everybody.